welcome back. This is the start of the final major topic in this course, which is all about memory. In this chapter, we're going to talk about the fundamentals of how memory works in Java. This may feel a little bit academic, but we need to get a good grounding in some of the basic concepts, as that's going to be crucial to understand how garbage collection works, and we certainly need this knowledge also before we can look at tuning the virtual machine. So in this chapter, we're going to cover what the stack and the heap are and how they work together to provide the memory that our applications use. We'll understand how variable scope actually works. How is it that variables declared in one method are only visible in that method? And we'll finish the chapter with a basic scenario. We'll consider how variables that we pass from one method to another are managed in memory. We won't be writing any code in this chapter, so you can sit back and I hope enjoy the video. As a developer, it is important to have a good understanding of how memory works in Java. This knowledge is going to be useful both to help optimize applications that you write and it can help you avoid creating problems in your code that will be very difficult to trace. Before we start learning about how memory works, I do need to say that the Java Virtual Machine is incredibly complicated. And as a Java developer, we don't need to understand exactly how it operates. Instead, we'll learn about different aspects of how memory is managed in a simplified format. We'll present the structures and relationships between different parts of Java's memory visually in a way which will hopefully be easy to understand. This isn't going to be a completely precise representation of how memory is actually managed by the JVM, but by the end of this section, you will have a good understanding of how memory works and how you should take account of this in your code. Our starting point then is understanding the terms, the stack and the heap. When our applications run, they need access to some of our computer's memory. For example, to store the objects that we create and hold in memory. This memory is split into two sections, the stack and the heap. The term the stack is very widely used and we'll be using it in this course, but actually there isn't a single stack in a Java application, there can be many of them. Every thread has its own stack. The stack is a very efficient data structure which is managed effectively by the Java Virtual Machine. One important aspect of the stack is that Java knows exactly when data on the stack can be destroyed. Now you may already be familiar with the concept of a stack from general computing. If you're not, then you need to know that the stack works as follows. We add data to the stack by pushing it to the top. Each time a new set of items is added, the data that was added first is pushed down towards the bottom of the stack and the new item goes onto the top. We can pull or pop data from the top of the stack. That is, we can only remove the last item to be added. The earlier items can't be removed until they reach the top of the stack. This is sometimes known as a first in, last out data structure. Each time you call a function, Java pushes the local variables for that function onto the stack. Here's an example of how this works. We've got a simple program here, which we're going to run through line by line, and we'll look at the state of the stack after each line. So our application starts in the main method. This method has a parameter called args, which is an array of strings. So this will go to the top of the stack. Next, we declare a variable, which is an int, called value. This gets pushed to the top of the stack. The next line of code calls a method called calculate, and it passes the value of the local variable called value to that method. A very important point that we'll be discussing in more detail shortly is that a copy of the variable is actually passed to the method. So as we enter the calculate method, a new variable is added to the stack called data this time, which is a copy of the value variable. So you can see now that the data for the first method, the main method, is buried down the stack. 
And in fact, these variables are out of scope for the current calculate method. The next two lines of the calculate method are again creating local variables which will be added to the stack. And the method now returns. So when the method returns, all the data created on the stack for that method is popped or pulled from the stack. This is really easy for Java to do. It's a fast and efficient operation. And that means that we've restored the stack to exactly the same state as it was in before the method was called. But as we're back now in the main method, remember that this line of code asks Java to reassign the value of the variable with whatever was returned from the method. So the value changes to the return of 20. We're now at the final closing bracket for our program, or more correctly, the thread is completed, and at this point, our stack will now be empty. Whenever you reach a closing curly bracket, any local variables that you declared inside the block that you're leaving is popped off the stack and destroyed. It's not just when you return from a method that the stack is popped, it's every time you exit a code block or reach a final curly bracket. And that is how scoping works. So in Java, all local variables are created on the stack and they are automatically popped from the stack when you reach the close of the block that created that variable. This all happens within the Java Virtual Machine, and as a programmer, we don't necessarily care that Java is using a stack. The developers of the JVM could have used a different data structure, but knowing that a stack is used helps us understand how a variable scope really works. Remember also that each thread has its own stack, so data on the stack can only be seen by the thread that owns the stack. So the stack is a tightly managed data structure, and Java can maintain very tight scoping rules with a stack. Stacks are great for local variables, because by definition we want a local variable to have a short lifetime. The second area of Java's memory is called the heap. The heap allows us to store data that has a longer lifetime than a single code block or function, for example objects that need to be shared across multiple methods. You can think of the heap as being a huge area for storing data. Actually, you can think of the heap as being all of the memory for your application, except for the data on the stacks. In an application, there is one heap, which is shared across all the threads, and a number of stacks, one for each thread. The designers of Java realised that most objects are quite big, and that most programs will want to pass around objects between blocks of code. By placing objects on the heap, this makes it easy to pass them around. All the threads, and in fact all code blocks in our application, can potentially access the heap. The important point here is that in Java, all objects are stored on the heap. So the stack is used for local primitive variables such as ints and doubles, but all objects such as strings, customers or integer objects will be stored on the heap. For the objects on the heap, there'll be a pointer to the object, which is the variable reference stored on the stack. For example, suppose we have two lines of code within a method, one that creates an int called age, and one that creates a string called name. Well, this first line of code creates a variable on the stack called age, and it has its value of 21. Because it's a local variable, which is a primitive, it's completely contained on the stack. The string, however, is an object rather than a primitive, so this is created on the heap. A variable is created on the stack, which points to this heap object. Let's have a look at a more complicated object. Here's some code that creates a list of strings, and then we pass that list from one method to a second method. In the main method, we're creating the myList object as a list of string objects. So when the main method runs and this list object is created, there'll be a reference to the object or a pointer to it created on the stack, but the object itself will be created on the heap. The myList variable on the stack will contain the memory address of the part of the heap that contains the list object. So the rules for how variables are stored in memory in Java are as follows. 
objects are stored physically on the heap. The variable holding the object is just a reference to that object. And the reference, if it's held as a local variable, will be stored on the stack. Primitives are entirely local variables. There are no objects for these to reference, so these live entirely on the stack. Now this at first might feel quite complicated, but it's worth understanding these rules because the whole of Java's memory model is built upon this. Let's now run line by line through our list program and we'll visualize what the memory looks like. At the start of the program, we have an empty stack and heap. Now I know that the main method contains a parameter which is an array of strings called args and this will be the first item on the stack but to keep this picture clear I'm going to ignore that one. If I was going to be complete I would have a box on my stack called args. Note that the boxes I've got on screen for the stack and heap are not representative of their actual sizes. In reality, the heap is a massive amount of storage space compared to the stack. But let's now run through and work out what gets created on the stack and heap as each line of our program runs. So the first line of code is going to create the list object. The new keyword in this line means find some free space on the heap large enough to store this object and we'll reference this new object from the local variable called myList. So I'm created on screen here a box within the heap to represent the data for this object, the list, and a box on the stack called myList which is the variable that contains the memory address of where in the heap this object lives. In Java you can't view this address or have any access to it. Now let's look at the next line of code. This line is adding a string to our list. Now a string of course is an object in Java, so Java will need to create this string object. We can actually think of this line of code as being the same as adding a new string with a value of 1. When we think of it this way, we can see that there's a new keyword in this line. So that means Java needs to find some space on the heap large enough to store the string object. So Java will create an object on the heap of type string with a value of 1. And this will be referenced from within our list. By calling the add method, we add the reference to the string object to our list object. Note that there's nothing created on the stack for this string. We don't have a local variable reference. The reference is only in the list object. If we think about the code that we can write, we can't call the string object that we've created directly. We haven't given it a variable name. We can only access the string through the list object, and this is represented by the stack and heap diagram that we can see here. In code, we can only reference the local variables that are on the stack, and the string that we've created is not reachable directly from the stack. As we progress through the code, other string objects will be created in the same way. Note that I've put these string objects in different parts of the heap. Where the objects actually reside in the heap is not visible to us as programmers, but I'm making the point that there's no reason for the objects to necessarily be close together or in any kind of logical order. We've now got objects scattered all over the heap, but ultimately we can access any of these objects through some route. As coders, we can only access their reference in the stack, but we could get to, for example, the second string object by calling myList dot get and then the item in position one. Let's advance now to the line which calls the print list method. The declaration of this method is public void print list and then we pass into the method the list of strings and we call it data. So when we're in print list the stack will now look like this. A new local variable is created called data and this variable points to the same object as the myList variable. It's a copy of the myList variable and the reference from myList is copied into data. Because we're now in the printList method, the myList variable is now however out of scope. We can't access it. 
Let's now expand the second method to do something more interesting. So here's a new version of print list, and before the first line runs, the heap and the stack are just as we can see on screen here. What will it look like, however, after this first line runs? Well, the get method of the ArrayList class is going to return a reference to the object that we want. As we're storing this in a local variable called value, this means a new reference on our stack will be created. Now, I'm using different colored arrows in this diagram here. That's purely to make it clear which box on the stack points to which box on the heap. There is no significance between the colors that you're seeing on screen. So note at this point that the object with the value 2 is now referenced from two different places. It's referenced in the list as the item in position 1, and it's referenced from the stack as the variable with the name value. The next line of code will create another object on the heap, and that I hope will be quite straightforward. And then we return from the print list method. As we're reaching a closing bracket, this means that the value and data variables that were created within this method are going to be popped off the stack. So some of the references are also going to be lost. And also the myList variable is now back in scope. The significant thing here is that the first method is going to see the modified list. It's got the extra item in it, the item with a value of 4. Remember that the second method was working on a copy of the reference to the list, but not a copy of the actual list object itself. So now we should have a reasonably good understanding of how memory works in Java. Objects that we create live on the heap, with local variables referencing those objects on the stack. As we add new variables, the existing ones are pushed down the stack, and the new variables go to the top. We learned how variable scope works. As we enter a method, the current variables on the stack go out of scope and are pushed down the stack, and the variables for the current method are added to the top of the stack. When we exit a method, the variables that live within the method are then popped off the stack, and the variables further down get moved up and come back into scope. And we talked through a basic scenario, where we pass a variable into a method. It's a copy of the reference to any object that's actually passed. Having a good understanding of these concepts is going to be really important when we get to talking about garbage collection and tuning the virtual machine. But don't worry if this still feels a little bit academic. We're going to be looking further at how the stack and heat work in the next few chapters, and it will become practical quite soon. So in the next chapter, we're going to talk about passing objects around our code by reference or by value. 